Okay, welcome to all those that have just joined us. Welcome to this uh, Edmund Hillary or EHF uh, investor live session. We run these sessions once a month and it's so that the New Zealand ecosystem can get to meet our investor fellows and understand what it is that they plan on doing in the New Zealand ecosystem. And so this month we have got Mark Bregman interviewing Ryan McIntyre and they're going to talk a little bit about what um, Ryan has been doing and is going to do in the New Zealand market but then also some similarities that the two of them and differences that they notice between US and New Zealand tech um, scene because they have both spent quite a bit of time in New Zealand over the years. And just a reminder, this session is recorded, so it will be there on the website for you to have a look at afterwards. And feel free to ask questions in the chat or you'll be able to put your hand up and ask the questions directly or you can just direct message me or Mark. And because it's a nice small group, we'll be able to get a good conversation going. So I'll hand it over to you, Mark. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, as Michelle mentioned, um, at least I'll tell you a little bit of my background and then I'll pass it over to Ryan. I've had a long connection to New Zealand. I've uh, invested in property in the South Island in 1999, and I've been traveling back and forth longer than that. Um, starting in early 2018, I decided at the end of a kind of corporate uh, CTO career to focus on early stage investment in New Zealand, specifically New Zealand. Um, and I started spending about a third of my time uh, in New Zealand and the remainder of it in the US. That was great until COVID hit and now I'm stuck on the US side of the wall uh, and spending generally several hours a day on Zoom calls with people in New Zealand. Ryan, you wanna spend a second and introduce your connection to New Zealand? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to good to be here virtually anyway. Um, let's see, I first came to New Zealand just on holiday with my wife back in 1998. We did a cycling trip from Nelson to Queenstown down the uh, down the West Coast. Uh, and, uh, you know, fell in love with New Zealand. Then we came back in 2003. My wife did the Ironman uh, Lake Topo. Um, and uh, also uh, our son is 17. Um, and if you do the math, it probably means he was conceived in New Zealand. Although as a 17 year old, we wouldn't tell him that. And he would be, you know, squirming in his chair right now um, uh, if, 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 he were, if he were listening in. But, um, and uh, so I've always, uh, you know, always loved New Zealand. I got more serious about spending time in New Zealand in starting in, in 2016, um, following the disastrous outcome of the 2016 election in the US, uh, I decided it would be prudent to have a, uh, um, a backup country as it were. And uh, New Zealand was the obvious choice and, and um, got an investor visa. Um, and so, you know, despite the fact that I'm a EHF cohort seven fellow. I actually applied to EHF sort of long after I had an, an investor visa and a residency visa simply to, you know, build a network of, uh, build a network of people, um, you know, who I've been fortunate enough to, to meet. Um, and so following the sort of three-year process of the investor visa, um, you know, we were back and forth for sort of, you know, 45, 60 days in, in uh, 2017 or 2018 and 19. Um, COVID hit, um, happily, we already had the investor and residence class visa and uh, escaped the US to New Zealand in uh, last July. Um, and we spent nine months, um, so I'm uh, in, in New Zealand, all over, all over the country. I'm, I'm now back in Boulder, Colorado, which is, um, you know, which is home mainly because our, our son was getting homesick and wants to finish his sort of final year of high school before he goes to university back, uh, back in the States. And, you know, the vaccine is ruling out here. So uh, I'm, I'm one dose in on Pfizer and uh, <laughs> uh, looking forward to getting my second on, um, on, on Monday. Um, but, um, you know, have had, feel really thankful that sort of New Zealand was, you know, this amazing welcoming place, it really our, you know, port in the storm during, uh, you know, the, the craziness of COVID. So I just feel very blessed to have been able to spend, you know, those uh, nine months there. Our plan all along had been to spend a season or two a year in New Zealand um, going forward. And so we packed in sort of three consecutive seasons for our, uh, you know, our first long stay and, uh, you know, uh, look forward to, to getting back. I, I hope there's a way to do it without another two weeks of MIQ um, because I don't want to 
repeat that uh, any more than is <laughs> any more than is necessary. Well, that, that's great, Ryan. I, I guess we have something in common. I actually am signed up, and my partner is signed up for the Taupo Ironman next March. Oh, awesome! So uh, that that might be another connection. Um, so, so you and I both have had connections with New Zealand before we really thought heavily about investing there. I guess, and I'd be interested in in what brought you around, uh, obviously you've been working in venture in the US, but what brought you around to the idea of actually investing in New Zealand rather than just, hey, it's a great place to live? Yeah, um, well, there, there's a couple threads um, that, I, that I could tie together uh, about that. So, you know, I've been working in, in the tech industry, um, you know, in, in the States, first in Silicon Valley and now, now back in Colorado since, you know, basically since I moved out there in, in 89 um, to, to for university and then, um, you know, sort of lived full time there for 17 years in the Bay Area and then um, moved to Boulder, Colorado in, in, in 2006. And, um, you know, while I was in the Bay Area, I was a software engineer, I was an entrepreneur, um, you know, started a company, sort of did the proverbial office in a Palo Alto garage through IPO thing, um, and then um, got into venture capital in 2000. Um, and then um, in in 2006, you know, decided to to move to to Boulder. It was really sort of a, a lifestyle and and family move, and it sort of felt like the Bay Area had run its course. And I was looking for something new to do. Um, the the venture capital firm I was with, Mobius Venture Capital, was was not going to. It was like a vintage 2000 bubble year, first bubble era fund, uh, you know, billion dollar fund, which was huge uh, at the time. And it was clear that that fund was not going to sort of continue in that configuration. Um, and so I was looking for something new to do um, and also was getting the entrepreneurial itch again. And sort of the way I decided to satisfy that was I wanted, but I also wanted to stay in venture was to start a venture capital firm. And that's, that's Foundry Group, which is uh, the firm I, I'm with now. And, you know, when I um, told people in the Bay Area in 2006 that I was moving away from the Bay Area to Boulder, Colorado to start an early stage technology venture capital firm, people looked at me like I was crazy, right? It was like, well, you're leaving the center of the universe to go do this, that's nuts. And, you know, despite the fact that the Bay Area is this incredible sort of hotbed of, um, you know, technology entrepreneurship, it had its own sort of brand of provincialism because it, it couldn't sort of imagine that, that, that there was a world outside of that. Um, and moving to moving to Boulder was, you know, a really interesting experience. And Mark, this is a very long way for me to get around to the New Zealand piece, but I think it, it sets the table well, which is, um, you know, when I, when I arrived in Boulder, it was, um, you know, maybe call it a, you know, a tier three, um, sort of venture ecosystem in, in the US, you know, it's a small town, it's 100 some thousand people, but it's part of the greater Denver metro area, which is almost 4 million people. Um, and it had a, um, you know, a nascent entrepreneurial ecosystem, and it had a lot of the sort of like raw materials that are sort of necessary for, for an entrepreneurial ecosystem to thrive. I mean, there was a lot of technology talent. It, it was, you know, Denver, Colorado area had very strong background in, in like telecom and, and the cable TV business. And um, interestingly, even sort of early days of data science, because that's where all these direct mail companies were based. And, and so, you know, it was much sort of lower tech uh, much smaller data back then, but you know there there was a sort of a this core entrepreneurial community. There was they were strong in um, storage, like so there's a uh, storage tech, and a number of disk drive companies were created out there, and so it um, so it had a lot of technology talent. There was you know a, a small number of venture firms, um, and you know sort of an, in, an entrepreneurial cycle that sort of really got started in the sort of mid to late '90s. Um, and so there's, you know, a sort of a wave of, um, you know, kind of first time entrepreneurs who were funded then had success and were, you know, starting to do venture number two or venture number three, you know, in the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, but it was, it was a much more nascent ecosystem. Um, you know, many of you have probably heard of my, you know, much more famous partner at Foundry Group, Brad Feld, who's written a number of books, Startup Community, Startup Community Way, um, you know, and that really 
sort of focus on sort of his and our experience um, in, in, in growing the Boulder ecosystem. Um, and I think there's a lot of parallels there to what I see um, in New Zealand. Um, and, you know, this is, and it's a funny coincidence, right? But the state of Colorado in the US is basically the exact same um, square mileage, square kilometerage as New Zealand is, right? And it's pretty much the same population. It's like six, it has a lot less coastline. Yeah, yeah, six feet. Yeah, exactly. And it's way, it's way uh, more compact, right? It's a rectangle, not not this long uh, shaped set of islands. But um, um, you know, so there, there's just some interesting parallels in terms of sort of scale of population, scale of land, um, and and then also, you know, I think scale of, uh, you know, there's obviously New Zealand. You know, when I got to Colorado, and it was already true, even when Brad got to Colorado in the in, in the mid '90s, right? There had been entrepreneurial success stories there, um, you know, but, and, you know, New Zealand sort of, you know, obviously has that, has had, you know, several billion dollar exits, um, but still, you know, sort of not as, um, you know, robust an ecosystem as I was kind of used to compared to coming from, um, you know, coming from Silicon Valley. And, you know, people wondered back then when we were actively trying to recruit um, you know, people from the coasts to come join Colorado startups, like, well, okay, if, the, if I move my family out here, like, is there going to be another startup for me to join if the one I'm working with doesn't work out, you know, um, and is, there was all these questions about, like, okay, well, if I, you know, burn the boats and come to this community, like, is there, is there going to be enough um, sort of opportunity for me beyond sort of the one opportunity I might be looking at right now as a decision to you know, move to Colorado or, or, or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of like raw talent, um, you know, good, good schools, great technical talent, you know, um, a series of entrepreneurs who have, you know, been through the cycle more than one time, all those kind of things. That's, you know, again, like the numbers aren't huge, but those all exist in New Zealand, right? And so that's, uh, to me, very parallel to what I saw, um, you know, when, when I arrived at Boulder in, in 2006. And so I find it sort of very encouraging and very, uh, very exciting. Um, and, and that, you know, there's, uh, it just feels like there's, you know, so much headroom and room for um, New Zealand to run, uh, you know, going forward. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons I got pretty excited after I started spending more time in New Zealand. Um, you know, I, sh I should mention also that um, at Foundry Group, one of our um, strategies that's a little bit different and has evolved over time than a lot of venture capital funds is that when we started, you know, we were early stage investors, we would you know, invest in the seed round or series A round of a company. Um, and, um, and then, but my partners and I were active with um, personal money, we would invest in other venture capital funds. So, um, and we did a lot of that. And oftentimes it was with, you know, funds that we co-invested with a foundry group or just friends and colleagues that we respected. Um, and, and we found that to be a, for a very um, sort of powerful way to get a broader view on an ecosystem and understand what was going on. Um, and, you know, it also just cemented relationships among, you know, other, other venture investors. And so starting in 2016, when, when we kind of looked at our track record of sort of personal investing in other venture capital funds, we looked at it and said, hey, well, that's, you know, those were all really good investments, you know, in aggregate. Um, and the, the value of sort of furthering a network and the information flow that we would see um, convinced us that we wanted to give it a try to do that same thing, but at an institutional scale. And so we raised a fund in 2016 called Foundry Group Next, where uh, there was a $500 million US fund where we were gonna, where we allocated sort of 25 to 30% of that fund into investing in other venture capital firms. Um, and, and we were in that case, investing in firms that, that played earlier in the cycle than, than Foundry Group did. So more sort of seed stage and A stage investors, because sort of as time has gone on, we've tended more, you know, away from seed and more to, you know, A and B rounds and, and um, have been actively using our um, relationships with these funds that we've invested in. 
as sort of our proxy for the very earliest stage investing and then um, you know actively looking at their portfolios to find opportunities for us to then make direct investments in but so coming to um, coming to New Zealand um, I sort of took a page from that playbook and um, started you know sort of my my time in the in the New Zealand entrepreneurial ecosystem by uh, investing in a number of New Zealand venture capital funds um, as a good way to get a sort of broad a broad lay of the land because I didn't feel like I'd spent enough time there yet to to make uh, really informed sort of direct uh, direct investments so that you know that's still um, you know, something that I'll do maybe down the road in terms of making direct investments, but I've started by investing in, you know, a variety of, um, of New Zealand venture funds, you know, many of whom have EHF connections. So, um, you know, I'm an investor in, in Novak 5 and Hilferance and, and, and Mark's fund um, and um, uh, have made commitments to a total of eight um, uh, venture firms now in, um, in New Zealand um, you know, over and really did that sort of over my nine months while I was there. Um, so, you know, I'm very much still at the sort of beginning of my journey as a um, investor in, um, you know, in the New Zealand tech ecosystem. But and that was sort of but part of my strategy to get started was to you know, just become an LP in a bunch of different funds because I figure, you know, the, the sort of people who are on the ground are going to be um, the experts here. That's great. You've been very busy in a short time in New Zealand. Um, uh, I, ha I have indeed. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I, I tell myself that I'm a, um, and, and it is true, like in terms of personality type, I am, um, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. You know, I'm somebody who when, like, if I spend a lot of time out at conferences or meeting people like then I need to go to my, you know, quiet room and sort of recharge. Um, but, you know, sort of during my time in New Zealand, my wife kept saying to me, she's like, you know, I really, I think you tell yourself a lie when you say you're an introvert, right? Because I like I spent so much time meeting with people and, <laughs> and, and, and connecting with people. But so jury's still out, but, uh, you know, on, on the introvert versus extrovert, um, uh battle but uh yeah I was, I was busy and just you know excited to sort of further establish a network but also really excited about what i um you know the opportunity i saw in, in new zealand and you know one of the sort of critical things to establish a um you know sort of a self-perpetuating and growing startup ecosystem is to have more you know more and more funding sources right i mean obviously without great entrepreneurs and great talent and people who are actually willing to do the much harder work of starting a company as opposed to investing in companies, you know, you, you don't have anything. And, and so certainly th that, that prerequisite, I was pretty satisfied with, you know, I was totally satisfied it was already there, but then, you know, one of the big accelerants that we saw in Colorado um, and in Boulder was, you know, sort of as, as time went on, you know, more funds, got established in, in in Boulder, but also then sort of more um, funds from outside of Boulder, you know, from the coasts and whatever, more excited about investing um, in in Colorado companies. And again, that sort of, that just helps get the flywheel going. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I'm sort of happy to be part of, you know, helping, <laughs> helping that sort of part of the, the funding part of the ecosystem. Um, accelerate as well because in my conversations with various you know VCs and, and, and whatnot in New Zealand it, you know everyone was talking about their you know funding gaps and whether there could be more opportunities you know all the way through from seed stage you know all the way to to later stage investing but that it definitely felt to me like there's a real opportunity for um, uh, you know to really accelerate uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem by you know helping more funds get uh, you know, contributing more funds getting established. Well, I must say I'm very jealous of you having been in New Zealand because I'm more of an extrovert and I've been locked in this room for 14 months. <laughs> so, except for the little window in front of me that I could see people. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, I, I, I really resonated with what you're saying because I, when I started really focusing on uh, building a fund about three years ago, um, there was a real shortage of capital. There were very, very few firms. And now there are a lot more, as you pointed out, and there's more every day. But the other question I wanted to ask you about is, because you've been watching this scene for a while, have you seen an evolution in the 
not the, just the funding scene, but the actual startup scene. And in particular, are there particular sectors that you see as perhaps uniquely um, strong for New Zealand or have grown significantly in focus within New Zealand over say the last three to five years that you've been watching the, the scene? Yeah, so again, and I, I, I wanna be, um you know, clear that I am, uh, I'm a newbie in, in the New Zealand venture, um, you know, scene and startup scene. So, you know, this is all sort of somebody who's relatively new to um, the country and the ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, sort of take these observations with, with, with a grain of salt, right? Um, but, you know, one, one of the things I noticed was, you know, there's, we're seeing a lot of companies and, you know, in the downstream portfolios of the funds I've invested in, you know, I think there's a pretty unique sort of agriculture tech type blend of things or um, that, 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 I, that I saw, you know, a number of companies in, um, in New Zealand. And again, those are those kind of things that are, um, you know, unique to the place in some sense, right? And that's always something that, that can be powerful for, um, you know, when, when you ask yourself, well, what, you know, what's unique about, like couldn't could an investment be done anywhere or is there something specific you know about the place that's sort of helping it and so I, I was intrigued by those i was you know obviously you know rocket labs a you know great sort of high profile example but but um you know seeing sort of nascent um you know different sort of space related plays developing and and i think again and you know you ask yourself well why new zealand and you know again at least from what i understand about and i'm not a i'm not a space investor um you know in terms of doing direct venture investments much more of a software guy but you know there was an advantage to rocket lab to the launch locations in new zealand for you know the kinds of orbits that they were trying to reach and whatnot so you know i, I like seeing things that are sort of tied to you know, okay, there's something unique or specialist in, in, in New Zealand. And, you know, that's why sort of the space and agriculture tech. And then obviously there's just, a, I mean, you can do, um, you can do SaaS and payment techs, you know, sort of from anywhere, but, you know, there's obviously with, you know, again, picking a high profile company, companies like Zero or whatever, um, you know, a lot of sort of people who have been through now building, um, you know, enterprise SaaS, mid-market SaaS type, type plays. And so, you know, I think there's, also just plenty of talent in the ecosystem and experience in the ecosystem uh, to do those kind of, um, uh, you know, those kind of investments as well. Caveat all of this with, you know, my, I have blinders on because I'm generally speaking like a software infrastructure and to a certain degree, a consumer electronics investor, but those are most of the things I've focused on back in the US. So I'm also just not as much of a student of, of you know, sort of more, some more of the broad opportunities that are going on um, in, in the ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that has um, impressed me and somewhat surprised me over the last few years as the startup ecosystem itself has become more mature is the breadth of activity across sectors. And the fact that there are areas of deep tech where New Zealand, somewhat sometimes because of the university, just happens to have world-class expertise. Yep. Uh, other areas, as you said, like aerospace, where it started perhaps with one company and some things to do with the regulatory environment and geography. But now there's a whole ecosystem around aerospace, particularly now developing in Christchurch. And I think we'll see more of that. Um, as somebody coming from the outside, you and I are in the same boat here. Um, and, and also I think maybe because of our association with EHF, um, I don't know if that's a selection or if that's the cause or the effect, but, um, I think we both have a desire to have a positive impact on that ecosystem of startups and funding and all of that. When you come in from the outside, where do you see the biggest leverage for people that come from the tech world, maybe the venture world, come into a place like New Zealand, which is a relatively small market? Uh, how can we help the most? Well, I think, you know, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm mindful of, um, you know, having having spent time in New Zealand too, uh, you know, there are um, there's subtle cultural differences I think between sort of you know U.S. ways of doing business and New Zealand ways of doing business. And you know, first of all, I the last thing I want to be is the uh, you know uh, know it all American coming in and, and sort of prescribing like, well, here's how you know here's how you know you you could be so much better because I don't think that that's um, uh, that's not sort of productive or constructive. And I think, you know, every ecosystem 
you know, takes time to sort of learn what's unique about, you know, its own unique strengths, right? Like one of the, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, Brad would always say in, in his like, uh, especially in his first, you know, Startup Communities book, right? Which is like, there, there was this meme or this idea for a long time of like, okay, you know, we're going to become the Silicon Valley of, of whatever, of New York or of, uh, you know, Silicon Prairie and, or, you know, what in down in, in, in Austin, everything. And, you know, it's like, can we stop saying we want to be the Silicon Valley of something, right? Like every ecosystem should have its own sort of sense of place and unique aspects to it where the goal isn't like necessarily to be, to be that, right? And, and, um, and, and to sort of lean into your own unique attributes. Um, you know, I think one of the, um, you know, there's great technical talent in, in New Zealand. There's great, um, you know, and I, I was actually impressed by, you know, the number of sort of deep tech things that I saw um, going, you know, in, in my time um, in New Zealand as well. And again, not an area that I've done a ton of, um, a ton of investing in, but, but really kind of the breadth of, of things that um, are happening in New Zealand. I think, um, you know, some of the sort of learnings from sort of the tech industry in the U.S. and the venture industry in the U.S., um, you know, it can be things, well, first of all, you know, New, the great thing about, I think, New Zealand startups is they know from day one that, that they're, they're, they can't necessarily rely solely on the domestic market um, to, to reach a real scale, right? Like, you, you, you domestic market's great, but, you know, you sort of exhaust yourself at the 5 million, at the team of 5 million, and then you need to, you know, you need to be looking um, across oceans, whether it's, you know, the Tasman or, you know, or, or the Pacific. Um, and so I think, first of all, being, uh, for those of us coming from, you know, the U.S., right, being conduits to help both bring in capital from outside of the U.S., but also then help, um, help companies make that jump you know, across into the Pacific, um, you know, into, into markets in the U.S. Um, is, is, is something uh, we should absolutely, um, you know, be able, be able to help with. And then also just encourage that sort of cross-border investing, right? I mean, it's, it's interesting when I think back to um, sort of what Silicon Valley and Sand Hill Road uh, was, um, although, like when I was at Mobius Venture Capital in 2000, we actually were never on Sand Hill Road, but you know we were close enough, right? But like, um, you know, that there was people were sort of VCs in general were happy to invest, you know, as long as it was in like a 50 mile radius, right? You know, or like an easy drive, right? And and I think, um, and that's completely changed in the U.S. over time, where you have uh, you know East and West Coast VCs, in, you know, investing on both coasts and in the middle of the country, right? I mean, when we started, you know, when we started Foundry, we made it very clear from day one that we were not a regional firm. We were, you know, we happened to be based in Colorado, but because of our connections and network, we were going to invest sort of across North America. And it still meant that maybe 25, 30% of our portfolio wound up in, in the Colorado area, but we, the rest was spread across um, spread across North America, but we spent a lot of time focused on helping to bring, you know, entrepreneurs and venture investors from out of state to in to focus on the ecosystem um, in Colorado. And uh, you know, there was a, a huge increase over the last twenty years in Colorado, you know, funding from out of state venture firms. And so I think also for those of us who are sort of straddling New Zealand and the U.S., I think helping sort of lead the way to get. Um, other sources of capital also, and then other entrepreneurs, right, comfortable with making that investment in a New Zealand company or, um, you know, realizing, hey, maybe you want to move to New Zealand and live and work there. There's a vibrant ecosystem, you know, within New Zealand that you can be part of. But one thing we've also all learned as we sit here staring at each other on Zoom, right, is that you can also, um, you can kind of work from wherever you want. I spent, you know, I spent nine months attending my Monday partner meetings and, and my, you know, board meetings with my North American companies from New Zealand and it worked great, right? Um, but, uh, you know, but one of the things we really liked doing at Foundry Group and still do to this day was, um, you know, inviting you know, when somebody was coming in from out of town, it was coming in from the West Coast or the East Coast, right? Like sort of taking them on a tour of, you know, the sort of the local going that's on, the local entrepreneurial ecosystem and really um, helping, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, you know, executives from bigger companies, et cetera, um, 
sort of get comfortable that there was a critical mass um, in the place and that there was plenty of opportunity. And, and so, you know, I think uh, those of us who are on, you know, straddling can, can help can help with that, right, um, in particular. And I think that that's, um, you know, a good thing to focus on. And certainly, um, you know, New Zealand star has never been brighter sort of on the uh, on the international stage. And, certain, and, and obviously EHF has, has a lot of, uh, you know, American tech folks who, uh, you know, are part of it as well. Um, so it's, there's a bit of self-selection there, but, um, but again, I think that realization that like people from outside of New Zealand are intensely interested in New Zealand, whether for, whether, and that, you know, should be able to leverage that going forward, right? It's just a great opportunity. So first of all, do we have any questions? I, I, we've been talking for half an hour without anyone interrupting us, which is not uncommon when, Rhett, when Ryan and I are talking, no one has a chance to, but uh, there might be some questions from the audience. <laughs> if you have questions, either jump in or uh, you can put up your electronic hand somehow, or you can uh, just put them in the um, in the comments uh, section. The, uh, the other question I guess I would ask you is, in fact, you, you planted a great seed while I was, while you were talking, I think that there is such a thing um, as terroir for mm -hmm. venture. You know, I, I actually, my, my first business involvement in New Zealand was in the wine in, uh, arena, and we talk about terroir all the time. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, Marlborough uh, wine is different from a Martinborough wine is different from a Central Otago wine, et cetera. And I think what you were talking about when you were comparing Silicon Valley and, and Boulder and the idea that we don't go and recreate Silicon Valley in somewhere else, uh, is, an, is an aspect of that. And yet I still hear people say, oh, we should make, name the city in, in New Zealand, the next Silicon Valley. And it makes me cringe because I think that there are some unique attributes um, that give New Zealand startups and potentially also New Zealand investors a different perspective and therefore a unique opportunity in the world stage. I wonder if you have that feeling and if so, can you, maybe articulate just your own observations of what are some of those attributes? I mean, I have my own point of view, but I wanna hear what yours are. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, for, first of all, there's a, um, I, I do think there, to me, there's a um, sort of a, a self-reliance and uh, ingenuity that's, that's come to, you know, to, you know, when you, when you um, sort of live on a remote island nation, you know, first of all, there's a, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, historically, right, you kind of had to sort of figure out, figure things out for yourself, right, and that, that, that like kind of, um, and, and I think that's a sort of inherent part of, of the culture, which is like not being afraid of sort of attacking a problem and also not being worried about maybe if it's a, a, a sort of quirky or idiosyncratic approach to solving a problem, because actually in many cases, those turn out to be sort of the most creative and interesting, um, in, interesting solutions. Um, also, you know, generally speaking, most, you know, Kiwis I've met tend to have actually a very global um, inter international perspective, you know, which again, I think is, is almost mandatory if you're going to sort of be in, in, in business, but, but also just, you know, this, you know, culture of going and, um, you know, leaving the country for a while, coming back, studying internationally, working internationally. Um, it's, it's, a, um, you know, much more, um, you know, certainly than sort of the, you know, a much more um, globally oriented um, sort of, I think, average citizen than you would find, say, in the, in, in the U.S., right? And I think that that's, um, you know, that's a power to, um, a power to leverage as well. Um, and, you know, I mean, again, and back to this, just this notion also of maybe the, the fearlessness, but also the breadth, Mark, that, that you talked about, right? Um, um, you know, I was I was at a um, dinner with uh, with with Mobac sort of early in my in, in my time in Auckland, and you know, this is a sort of a funny example that you know intersected with my own direct experience, which is I wound up um, sitting next to the founder of um, Powered by Proxy, uh, which, which you know again was a, a sort of good good outcome, uh, great success in the New Zealand ecosystem, right? This wireless charging chi sets of uh, sets of technology that was acquired by Apple, 
Um, and it, it just so happened that I had been an investor in a company in, in, in the US that, would, that had built out um, uh, some, some wireless charging technology and products that um, uh, wound up failing, like, you know, again, ventures, ventures do. Um, and and <laughs> Powered by Proxy had actually just hired the founder of the company that I had invested into uh, at Apple. And, you know, it's just it's a total small world thing. But, and again, but it was an example of like, okay, here's, you know, putting, putting this sort of provincial um, Silicon Valley hat on. I'm like, okay, so somehow I invested in this company in the US that, you know, sort of had, was probably, it was, was certainly better funded, you know, had you know, in theory sort of sort of better connections into the Silicon Valley ecosystem, um, playing with a similar set of technologies. Um, and, you know, that investment didn't work out. And then yet here's this, uh, you know, th this company, you know, in New Zealand that winds up, uh, you know, sort of having a ton of intellectual property built around this very hard wireless charging technology that then winds up being, you know, the one acquired by Apple and is probably the, the most notable exit in that like uh, sort of wire, wireless charging domain. But, but again, it, it, to me, that was just a, um, you know, just a funny outcome that, uh, you know, and at my, one of my very first dinners mixing with the, uh, you know, VC community in, in the U.S., I, you know, find, find, I'm sitting next to the winner of, uh, you know, of, of, of a race that was, you know, uh, that, that one of the companies, founder group invested in didn't, you know, didn't wind up succeeding at, but here was this Kiwi company that did, right? And again, that's, uh, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, the other thing that I, I've really grown to like about um, sort of the Kiwi um, mindset is, you know, there's, I, I'm a fan of sort of humility in business and, um, as, and, and, you know, I think Kiwis tend to have that, um, and maybe sometimes to a fault, like there could be a little more, you know, you know, chest pounding going on to, uh, sort of tell the story to the world, but I actually really, um, you know, I, I really like and get the most satisfaction when we invest in companies that are just, they kind of fly under the radar and execute day after day after day. Don't don't spend a bunch of time sort of touting, um, you know, their their um, you know their achievements, but just continue to execute. And then you wake up one day and we're like, oh, okay, this this company that I've never heard of is a huge success, right? And uh, and and I like. Mm -hmm. Those to me are kind of among the most satisfying outcomes in venture, and I like that. Uh, I think the the um, you know New Zealand culture I think is probably more likely to produce those kind of companies over <laughs> over, over time, just given sort of the cultural norms. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, I think you know being you, you start off talking about being far away on an island, and I think some of the value of that is you don't know what you don't know, and I don't know how many you know, conversations I've had in Silicon Valley about some exciting new technology and people start naysaying it because they said, well, so-and-so tried that and so-and-so tried that and so-and-so tried that. And that discourages people. Whereas in New Zealand, they just try it and often break through. I think that's one advantage. Um, what would you rec What would you say to a, um, a startup in New Zealand, uh, a company that's looking to raise funds there are many choices. There's a very, as you know, uh, pretty deep and pretty broad angel community for very early stage investment. There are increasingly funds like, like mine and Hill France and others that can invest in the seed in Series A. Um, when you get beyond that to bigger investments, it gets a little more challenging. By then, there most of those companies have to look offshore, but frequently they start to look offshore even earlier. What would you advise um, an entrepreneur, a founder? Who's going through that funding journey uh, with respect to how to think about the portfolio funding opportunities and and how to manage that maze as they go through their journey? Yeah, well, I think um, you know again, I, it, it's what what I would say is you know that having to look sort of offshore, or like to use the parallel for companies in, in Boulder back years ago, you know, having to look out of state for, um, you know, new, new funding rounds is, you know, 
first of all, plan your capital formation strategy from day one to recognize that that's that that may be something that you that you need to do depending on sort of the the scale you're looking to you know the scale you're looking to achieve. And I think you know start by looking for you know angels and then funds sort of earlier in the investment cycle who have experience and connections with. Um, upstream sources of capital, be it, you know, in, in, you know, New Zealand, Australia, the US, whatever, um, and that, and, and, and try to, you know, get some investors on your cap table who have strong connections, um, you know, there, both in terms of, you know, sort of business connections for, um, you know, whether it's sort of sales and marketing for market entry purposes, but then also obviously for, um, you know, equity financing um, sources as well. So if you can sort of strategize to have folks, um, you know, on your cap table or we're going to have those kind of connections who might be helpful in, um, you know, bringing offshore funding sources in over time, I think that's, that'd be a good way to, uh, a good way to start anyway. Because uh, again, it's all going to be about networking to get access um, to those if you decide it's the right thing. I mean, obviously, there's um, examples of, of exits and companies that have grown up that you know haven't needed to do that within the New Zealand. And I do think there will be more capital coming in as evidenced by the fund formation that's happening that hopefully will allow for um, you know New Zealand to have more um, you know full life cycle funding within mm -hmm. you know, within the country itself, but um, but also just being realistic, like it would be, um, it would be a desirable thing actually if there's lots of sources of, of capital from outside of New Zealand also, you know, looking for opportunities uh, within uh, within New Zealand, right? That just that to the benefit of everyone in the ecosystem. So I'm I'm conscious of the fact that we haven't had any questions from the audience. I hope they're still awake. Um, any any questions from? Okay, Jessica, I see raising her hand. Hello, Mark. Hi, Ryan. How's it going? Good. Um, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I was curious about your last point you made, Ryan. Are there are you seeing many, um, you know, big venture capital, maybe later stage funds from Silicon Valley or other parts of the US or even Europe and the UK who are maybe setting up small outposts in New Zealand or actively doing scouting? Like, is there anything like that going on at the moment? That's a good question. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not aware off the top of my head of anyone sort of establishing, um, you know, an outpost or, um, you know, or a scouting program, but, you know, certainly, I mean, you know, directly aware of it, again, it's sort of attached to some of the, um, you know, sort of bigger, more high profile, um, you know, companies in New Zealand over time, but, you know, it's like Bessemer, Coastal Ventures, Founders Funds, I mean, if, you know, Founders Fund, there are, um, you know, uh, U.S.-based uh, venture firms who have already, you know, invested in New Zealand companies and and and, and continue to, and I I believe there will be more and more of those over time, right? I mean, right right now, just um, you know, Foundry Group's mandate is to invest in North American companies, so I don't I don't anticipate like Foundry making a direct investment yet, or, you know, or anytime soon in a in a New Zealand company, um, but there are certainly um, you know, those that already have, and I think more, more on the way, uh, but I can't, I would add that. beyond the ones I mentioned, Mark, maybe, you know, of some, well, no, I, I was going to add, I was going to tilt it slightly different way. I've had conversations with quite a few relatively early stage funds here in the U S who are interested to hear about New Zealand companies when they come to the U S and need funding. And so I've made a lot of introductions. Well, prior to COVID lockdown, uh, as as New Zealand entrepreneurs were in the U.S. Uh, to venture funds, not for the current round that the New Zealand company is raising, but to sort of be, you know, start building a relationship for a future round when they need money that probably is not going to be supplied just from a New Zealand uh, investment base. And the funds um, that I've talked to here are quite interested in that because they see the opportunity, but they don't have the wherewithal, shall I say, to do what Jessica, Jessica was suggesting to put an outpost in New Zealand so they can use some of funds like mine or, or like uh, Rob's and others as a bit of that, that remote outpost without having to physically do it themselves. 
Yeah, I'm. I'm just curious about that because there are quite a few. Um, I'm. I've, I'm. I work with Robert Hill Ferrance and you know things like that. But um, I have some you know other startups I'm working with on the side as well, and they're looking to you know go straight to the US and raise venture capital. And I lived in the US for years. I'm half American, and um, trying to create more of a pipeline between the two countries has always been something that I've always wanted to do, um, and you know bulk that out a bit more. And I feel like there could be something really interesting there obviously AHF does so much work for that um, yeah. but it's almost like the startup founders need to know more about what those resources are yeah yeah, yeah I do I mean we're at a moment in time I think where that could be we could really see that accelerate because again it's a, you know certainly the, the amount of interest I get from you know colleagues of mine in North America you know who are like just interested in New Zealand you know in general, but then also specifically hearing about my experiences with, um, you know, with the ecosystem. And so certainly I think there's, you know, there's never been a more opportune time to, I think, cultivate that interest. Um, yeah. I think that's true. Any other questions from our audience? So Rob, or Ryan, you're back in uh, the States now. And yep. I've talked about this. I think um, neither one of us are in a situation where we're likely to be 100% of the time in New Zealand for the next several years anyway. Um, as you look at the evolution of what you're doing, your involvement in New Zealand, how, do you, how are you seeing the way to manage that with a, a kind of a foot on both, in both countries? Yep. Well, so first of all, I mean, you know, I'm already, uh, you know, I, I very much uh, miss New Zealand already. I've only been, you know, away for you know, three weeks now. Um, but, um, you know, so I'm plotting, you know, plotting my return, although again, it, it'll hopefully happen when I don't have to do MIQ. Um, and, you know, first of all, I mean, the good news is, right, my nine month experiment of sort of living in New Zealand, getting, sort of my toe in the ecosystem there, but then also, um, you know, but then also obviously continuing my work with Foundry Group and Portfolio, um, you know, really kept my full-time job while, you know, while, while living in New Zealand, right? It's like, first of all, now knowing that that sort of, you know, this great experiment that was forced on us by a global pandemic, you know, it makes me more confident than ever that I could sort of straddle the two locations. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, I think that sort of the connectivity afforded by you know, everything going virtual is going to make that uh, is going to make that a lot easier. And then, you know, I think more of it is just for me more more runtime and you know, more time back in New Zealand and getting into more of a cycle of you know figuring out okay, is it a season a year, is it two seasons a year, um, uh, and you know, sort of getting a rhythm, um, you know, getting getting a rhythm going, um, and certainly you know just the start that of the first you know nine months that I spent here and, and becoming part of EHF and everything was just a like a fantastic way to sort of pack it all in early on so like I'm still so energized from that and we kind of we'll see um, you know we'll, we'll, we'll see going forward but I you know hope hopefully the, the friction of moving between the places will you know be reduced as uh, as hopefully the, the pandemic recedes and I can do uh, I can do more of that. I mean, I, I feel somewhat the same way, which is I'll, uh, I think there's actually value, particularly given what we're doing, uh, trying to help these uh, New Zealand startups make it into the bridge to the US market. There's real value in being a little bit anchored in both places because it does make for a bridge, better bridge. Um, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot now. And this is kind of like, I guess if you're on CNBC in the morning and you're a financial analyst at the end of the session, they always ask you, what are your top three picks? So if you were, what are the, what are the companies you've seen? I'm not, I'm not suggesting you're invested in them or not, but the ones that get you excited, either because they're radically different and they're kind of cool, or because maybe you think they're going to be fantastically successful, or maybe they're ones that you are invested in. You don't have to tell us. Right. Right. So again, I'll, I'll give the caveat that my, um, you know, I, I haven't made any direct investments right. yet in, in in New Zealand companies. Right? It's uh, I've made I've made investments and commitments in in these uh, in these venture capital firms. So, you know, I think there there's a little bit of a um, you know a little bit of a TBD there, um, but you know certainly um, 
you know, a couple ones that just sort of fascinated me. It, and it's not even necessarily related to um, sort of stage or scale or, or even, even traction that the companies are having. But, you know, I, I spent some time over at, um, you know, the level two incubator and, and you know, just, um, you know, there, there was a, a, a company, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, that was basically doing a um, sort of electromagnetic propulsion to move satellites between, you know, um, between orbits and, and, and whatever, or, you know, Halter, which is the, 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 the company that allows you to sort of remotely control, you know, herds of cattle and, and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that, you know, that one st strikes me as like a, uh, you know, a great example of terroir, right? <laughs> you know, in, in particular, just, you know, fun uh, companies that have um, um, sort of stuck in my you know stuck in my head after having ha had some interactions with them you know those uh, those were fun ones again i'm not i'm not directly invested in any of those um um certainly um uh, mint super cool yeah. right um and uh you know that's uh in, in in a couple uh you know uh a couple venture portfolios um you know that that one's exciting um but again um you know, I feel like I would to to be more uh, more than just flipping off the cuff like I just did to be more informed. That'll, that'll that'll take some more time. But I guess the bottom line is, from what you've said, and I've certainly felt this myself, there are a lot of exciting companies in New Zealand. When I uh, first told my friends on Sand Hill Road that I was looking at doing an a venture fund in New Zealand, their um, first reaction was, "Why would you go to New Zealand?" There are no good companies there. The entrepreneurs are not um, aggressive. And the reason they're not aggressive is there are no natural predators. You should go to Israel. Everyone's trying to kill those guys. They're very aggressive. I've run those Israeli companies and I know what they mean and it's not where I want to spend my time. But then my first question to them was, oh, so there are no good companies in New Zealand. Have you been to New Zealand? And the answer was universally no. Right. So I think that what you were just reflecting is exactly what I discovered, which is there are some very interesting companies in New Zealand They've been very much under that, uh, sort of under the bushel. No one's seen them because they've been so far away and remote. And, and uh, I think now we're starting to see that change. I think over the next three to five years, we'll see a change a lot as more of these companies get into the bigger global markets. Um, and I think the last um, 12 months, I'll be interested is in understanding your perspective because you were in New Zealand for this. But my perspective was, you know, things here in March through about July of last year in the US, companies just hunkered down, put their heads down. A lot of the VCs told their, their portfolio companies, save cash. We don't know how long this is going to last. Just, you know, hibernate. Yep. And that yep. didn't happen in New Zealand in the same way. And then even as things came back in the US, they didn't come back at the same, in the same manner, in the same way that they have in New Zealand. So there's a uh, there's been a, a period of a year now where New Zealand's continued to move ahead while the rest of the world has really slowed down pretty dramatically. Did you feel that being when you were in New Zealand? Yeah. The other I, side mean, of yeah. I mean, it's, well, uh, one thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, it, again, it was sort of magical to be in a place that sort of felt like the world used to be. Um, and, and obviously like, it, and it's not to say that, um, you know, obviously closing the borders and everything. You know, like New Zealand was hit hard as well, right? And like, to, you know, it shined a light on sort of the dependence of, uh, you know, the tourism industry and whatnot, which which I think is, uh, you know, and I think motivated a lot of people to say, well, what, what can we do to have, um, to help, you know, again, build build the tech industry, build startup industries, build, you know, uh, and, and build build out an economy that's, that's not going to be as dependent on, on on tourism dollars, so I think that got a really good start in New Zealand. Again, I think it's all part of one of the reasons why, you know, I I, I sort of bullish um, on, on the region, and so I think that uh, you know I think that's I think that's one of the things that was both a combination of there was sort of relatively less impact because people weren't like forced into endless recurring lockdowns and you know the country was relatively unscathed from you know the ravages of uh, in, infection and whatnot um, but you know coming back here right for the last three weeks right I, I mean my um, sort of my feeling of sort of personal freedom and mobility has like taken a big step back right because I, I you know went from 
not thinking about, you know, walking down the street, grabbing a coffee or a beer to think, you know, now having to plan like, well, okay, do I really want to go out and, you know, wear a mask, what's open, you know, when, can I, when, will, I, when will I be fully vaccinated, whatever. So, um, you know, it's, it, I, 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 for me, um, having spent the sort of four first months of the pandemic in lockdown in the U.S., like I'm, I'm glad I experienced that because I had sort of empathy for you know all my fellow, uh, you know North American citizens, but it also made me really appreciate sort of what an amazing place to be uh, you know during COVID times New Zealand really was because I you know just saw such a sort of stark difference between the two, and now even you know on what's in, where hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel with the pandemic in the U.S. Um, and you know I'm all vaccinated on May 31st like they're yet even so where we're at this sort of point where we're hopefully we're coming out of it you know I still feel like my the restrictions on my life you know are, are very different even now being back in, in, in the U.S. than they were uh, than they were in New Zealand so um, it's, it's been interesting to sort of bookend <laughs> my, my, my time during the pandemic with, you know, sort of nine months in the middle of sort of relative freedom with, with uh, you know, uh, some re restrictions on the, uh, on the other sides of it. Great. We, we have a question from Elizabeth Jennings, and we're almost, um, almost out of uh, time, but this is a good question. It says, from the outside of New Zealand, what do you feel is the single most important element that can be added to the Kiwi innovation ecosystem? Uh, what can be added that will have the biggest impact in accelerating global market entry and connection to foreign investor investors and opportunities? I mean, so I, I mean, I wish there was, um, I wish I could come up with a single thing, right? I mean, you know, the, the problem is, is that, you know, entrepreneurial ecosystems are, um, are ecosystems, right? They're, right. Networks, They're complicated. Complex, <laughs> adaptive systems. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, and the things you need to get, um, to sort of get the flywheel turning faster, because it's already going in New Zealand, right? I mean, there's plenty of entrepreneurial successes and um, already, uh, you know, the other, um, uh, the, the other company I, I forgot to mention, I feel like was New Zealand Terroir, um, you know, uh, was this, uh, you know, sequent, which would, you know, in Christchurch, mm -hmm. was bought for, you know, billion dollars, right? It's like, I'd never heard of that company, right. you know, doing this like very specialized, uh, you know, geotechnical, you know, modeling software or whatever. And like, and again, another great example of, uh, of you know, they hear that they're Christchurch doing something better than anybody else in the world, uh, partially because why not, right? You know, and, and, um, and so I think that really what, you know, I think New Zealand just, needs more turns of the wheel, right? Part of sort of growing growing entrepreneurial ecosystems is sort of a, a long-term commitment to multiple cycles of formation and exits and, and then, you know, a culture of the entrepreneurs who are successful, um, you know, starting, multi, you know, starting another company or, or investing their um, you know, their earnings, if you will, back into the ecosystem. And, and more examples of that, um, um, you know, just in terms of higher profile exits and whatnot, just add to sort of the, the, the realization that, hey, there's, uh, you know, here's this market in New Zealand, and we can already point to several sort of multi-billion dollar, you know, billion dollar plus exits, many hundred million dollar plus exits. And, um, you know, growing availability of, of, of venture funding, more funds being formed, right? Again, there's, there's not really one thing. Not one. Say, right? sort of it, it's point. like we need more of all of those things. And, and the, the good news is, is, to me, it appears that more of all of those things are happening, right? Um, you know, it's not a silver bullet, but the one thing I would say, and it's sort of what you, it sort of builds on what you just said is, it's more the connectivity. Uh, one thing that is a little bit surprising, has been a little bit surprising to me, is that um, New Zealand, despite its small size and its tight network, is still relatively siloed in certain areas, uh, the universities and within the universities, within certain disciplines. And so the connection between the different investors, between the different 
uh, disciplines, et cetera, um, I think would really be an amplifier for what New Zealand is already really good at. Yeah, no, I think, in, yeah, increasing connectivity, obviously, sort of you know, across across countries and markets as well, um, is important. Um, is important too. But again, I think all the sort of raw all the raw ingredients are already there, um, you know, and it's uh, I think an exciting time for, for New Zealand. I'm certainly now we need to make soup. Part of it. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah. now, I just, now I just need to figure out, you know, when to come back. Yeah, yeah, nice. It could be a while without isolation. Well, if you can solve that problem, I'll be there on the next flight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we, yeah. Need, uh, we just know. need our vaccinations, right, as a country. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and vaccine passports, right? So people can come who have been vaccinated and maybe do three days of MIQ and not 14 or something like yep. that. Yeah, exactly. nice. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I love hearing your story. More comes out each time. And thanks, Mark, for interviewing. It was great to um, have someone with insights doing the interviewing and, and adding the flavor to it. it was good. So next month, uh, team, we have um, Aaron Bird. And then we've got Dave Insel, who is sitting here, is going to do one in July. And then we're also going to have Andy Sack come and do a, a session as well. So it's great. Thank you for your time. It was good. It was good to 